welcome to a new episode of Hello World. Today we're going to have the opportunity to visit the shipping industry. So, like many uh, of you, uh, we've heard about the emission discussion uh, regarding airplanes polluting the air and so on, and now we all have the opportunity to CO2 compensate actually when we yeah. buy tickets and, and purchase that. Um, but I don't think anybody is as um, familiar with the shipping industry. And of course, there is a lot of emissions within the shipping industry today indeed, uh, indeed. as well. So we're going to meet Greg Atkinson, who is this, the Chief Technology Officer at Echo Marine Power today. And Fredrik, you actually met him many years ago. How did you meet? Yeah, uh, actually Greg hired me as a sub-project manager when uh, they were starting building uh, UMTS 3G network in Japan. Uh, so he was one my manager for uh, almost two years actually. Uh, so I moved there and uh, met him for the first time there and uh, we have been working there uh, together. Yeah. Uh, so why not just welcome Greg to our Hello World. Hi Greg. Hello, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Nowadays, it feels like, like you don't have an ordinary job. Uh, you are uh, on a mission, or, or what you could say. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your job you have today? Yeah, so w what we did is we uh, started off as a, as a design organization. And the idea was to investigate ways of reducing fuel consumption uh, on ships. And in the beginning, it was is very technical, and we were looking at engines and engine power, speed curves, etc. But I guess out of that study, we started to look at uh, renewable energy and thinking about how renewable energy could be applied to shipping, and uh, how we could utilise that to reduce fuel consumption. And then, if you lower fuel consumption, then you lower emissions. And then from there, it just expanded. It just expanded into a number of different studies and then uh, we started a company and then uh, we started to move products out. Uh, nice. But how did you end up in the shipping industry? Because I know you have a background there as well. Yeah, it was, it was still like a 360, I guess. I, I started uh, in the Navy in um, electronics engineering and then I went into telecoms and then just by a twist of fate, um, I come back to, to shipping. Okay. So it's, it's, yeah, like a 360, I guess. <laughs> back to the roots. Yes, back yeah. to the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned that env environmental concerns are actually not, I mean, they are important, but that's not the only reason why you're doing what you're doing. But it's as also really important to reduce the emissions out of health concerns. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so at the beginning, it was actually more of a health concern issue. Um, so the, the fumes from shipping or the exhaust from shipping has is, is got a lot of particulate matter in um, and it's, it's bad for health. I think the estimate, or one estimate is that there's about 60,000 uh, premature deaths a year due to shipping emissions. Mm. Um, I think it's something like about two or three hundred uh, two or three hundred million uh, people are directly or indirectly um, exposed to shipping emissions. And of course, Black carbon in particular matter gets in, into your lungs, so it's not good for health. And that's where we started. We actually started more from a, a health background. But, of course, now over the years, um, there's been more focus on CO2 and global warming. So it's now a combination of both. It's a, it's a health issue and it's also an environmental issue. So, okay. you know, shipping, I think... Um, uses somewhere in the vicinity of about 300 million tonnes of fuel, heavy fuel literal a year. So it's, it's a lot of fuel and it's a lot of emissions. Yep. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. I mean, we, we, don't live, uh, I, we don't live in a harbour. Uh, well, we have a harbour actually, but it's not sort of considered as a harbour town. But do you feel like, are people aware about the risk? I'm, I'm, I'm meaning more citizens actually in, in sort of cities or areas that are close to, to big harbors? Are they aware of the, 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 so the sort of the danger that it might be in, in that sense? I think to some extent, but uh, you know, generally shipping is uh, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Um, unless you see a cruise ship or you see a, you know, a big cargo ship coming in, 
I guess most people don't even think about shipping. Oh. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons that it was a bit off the um, regulation radar uh, because it's, it's sort of out of sight. The emissions, you know, they're sort of out, out in the ocean. Um, but, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot more focus on it. Uh, Eco Marine Power, uh, the company where you are working, what what are you doing to solve these problems, both with health and and, and uh, pollution? So our primary focus is to try to reduce fuel consumption, and then if you reduce fuel consumption, you reduce emissions. Um, initially, we we were looking at uh, solar to take some of that reduction. We've moved more into wind now, so we're, we're trying to use a system of rigid sails. Um, we also investigate uh, energy storage and fuel cells, and we're trying to develop a, a framework or a pathway that will start off with fuel reduction, but hopefully then end up with what we could call zero emission ships. So that, that would be a ship that's uh, powered by renewable energy and fuel cells and, and maybe some other technologies. Okay. But how, how far have you, have you come into that uh, mission, vision? Yeah, so we, we've just moved out uh, two or three systems using solar and uh, energy storage onto ships. Um, the sail system or array of sails that we've developed are going through the approval process now. And, you know, we're looking at somewhere like 2021, maybe 2022 to, to have the full solution ready. Okay. That's cool. So what would you say are sort of the main challenges with implementing what you're doing? I'm assuming that, I mean, uh, shippers don't buy new ships every day and every year even. And uh, so sort of wh how, how, yeah, what are the main challenges and how long would you take, would you say it's going to take to reach some sort of scale on this? Okay. So one of the big challenges is just the industry itself is, is fairly conservative. Um, so that, that it's not an industry that will necessarily be leaping um, towards new technologies. In the past, the cost of fuels also been quite low, so there, there's not a there hasn't been a real financial incentive for them to invest in these technologies because they can get heavy fuel oil at about four hundred dollars a ton. But recently, this has started to change, and the regulations are coming in. Uh, the International Maritime Organization is moving a lot of policy initiatives through. Um, there's the sulfur limits on fuel, and it, it's, I guess, gradually pushing the industry uh, towards using these technologies. But certainly the biggest barrier, I would say, um, over the last few years is just the, the conservative nature and the lack of a cost, cost incentive. Yeah. So are there more companies than yours working with sort of looking into these kind of technologies to find new ways of, of sort of, yeah, do shipping but without using uh, fuel in the same way that we've done before? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few companies now moving into this. And some of the big shipping companies like Maersk have just announced that they're going to set, set up an R&D centre for zero emission, sh zero emission shipping. So there is quite a big shift going on. Um, a lot of this is coming, you know, a push from, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement and regulations. But also it's good to see that some of the big shipping companies uh, are stepping up and, and pushing this along as well. Yeah. So how long do you think it's going to take before you sort of have a, yeah, a scalable solution where we're actually going to see, see a difference? Because I assume it's not enough that one ship or two ships have, have it, but actually the industry needs to sort of change as such. Yeah, that's right. I mean, realistically, I think it's going to take a decade before you'll see a big, big shift. And we've just had this virus um, outbreak, which has totally decimated, you know, sectors like the cruise ship industry. I mean, they're, yeah, they're in a lot of pain. I mean, they're yeah. losing millions, hundreds of millions a month. Other shipping companies are also under a lot of trouble. So this, this is going to delay things. So, uh, you know, I'd say realistically... Yeah, it's going to take a decade, I think, before you see a big, big difference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I only had the possibility to live in uh, Japan for two years uh, and started to understand the, the cultural difference there. Um, you 
as an Australian, have been living there for more than 20 years. Uh, what, what what is needed for a foreigner to succeed in Japan? Because I think we can say that you actually have succeeded quite well. Yeah, well, I, you know, when it comes to cultural issues, I think um, I'm still struggling with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's, there's things, some things that I just don't get. Um, I, I think you just need a, a fair bit of patience. And one of the things that I would say, and I, I don't want to generalize, of course, but it, it's very relationship based in Japan. It's not like, a, you know, a quick exchange of a business card and, uh, you know, and then business starts. Sometimes it takes quite some time. Uh, some of the partner companies I've been working with, you know, it took years to, to establish that relationship and trust. So, you know, I'd, I'd say patience. And I think the other golden rule whenever you talk about cultural issues is um, is just because someone does something different that doesn't mean they're doing it wrong or it doesn't mean there's not some sort of logic behind what they're doing. And I think if you approach any culture or any situation like that, you've got to get a lot further than sort of trying to push back or, you know, thinking it's just the wrong way to do things. I, I, I have the feeling of, of that the Japanese industry and way of working is very strategic and, and they have a long, uh, yeah, their vision is quite far away. They don't do things quickly, but they do things well. Yeah, well, that, that's right. I mean, um, a good example, and the one that I often use is uh, high-speed rail. So, you know, Japan started uh, working on the Shinkansen or the high-speed rail probably in the mid-50s, um, you know, which is decades ahead of anyone else. Um, they then launched it in 1964 or thereabouts, and then it was only probably a decade after that that they started on the maglev. And, the, you know, the maglev train, I think, is going to come in, come in at about uh, 2030. So, you know, it's a huge, you know, multi-decade thought process of starting in the mid-50s and just keep going, you know, all that way to the maglev. And, you know, this, that's, that's a long strategic uh, thought process by anyone's standard. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. But how far would you say that Japan has come when in, ter in terms of sort of digital transformation? Yeah, I mean, um, again, it's a hard thing to say. I mean, uh, I have a home office with an unlimited one gigabit per second broadband connection. So on that side of things, you know, it's, it's quite advanced. Um, there are some other areas where there's a little bit of paperwork and involved and uh, some of the cashless payments is, is a bit behind, but it's starting to pick up now. Um, but, yeah, it, it varies. I mean... Uh, Overall, I'd say it's quite advanced, but, um, uh, you know, it, on an engineering side, I always get the impression it's a bit more hardware focused than uh, software focused, but uh, Frederick would know more about that than me. He's, he's more of a software guy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that's true, that's true. Yeah, uh, I have been working for a long time at Sony as well, so uh, I must say they are really, really skilled in the hardware part, definitely. Uh, and uh, as a Swede, I think, the merge there where we are quite good in, in software here in Sweden. I think that's a good merge, actually. Yeah. Um, right. Indeed. indeed. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for uh, taking the time to join us and uh, let us look, look into the shipping industry. I think it's quite fascinating to, to think that we're going to have ships that are have sails that are sort of even more driven by wind than the original old ones, I guess, yeah. and, and solar power and so on. Maybe it's it's even back to back to the old days, but in a futuristic way. Could you say that? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I, I guess so. It's like a lot of things. I mean, uh, you know, with most renewables, we're sort of relearning, um, yeah, you know, sort of how to use things that we used in the past. So, yeah, that's a good way of expressing it. We're sort of using old technologies or old methods in a new way. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, impressive. So thank you so much and enjoy your day. Thank you, Greg. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's actually interesting how we come back to the roots. Yeah, I think how we did things for centuries. I think yeah. uh, there are some wise things that have been, been uh, made before as well. Yeah.
Yeah, of course. But we're using technology to make it smarter and better and more efficient. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a good combination, yeah. I guess. Yeah, a yeah. good improvement. Perfect. So thank you for joining us today and uh, make sure to follow us on LinkedIn so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.